And welcome to the Dad's Television Network. Another hour for you. This hour we're going to talk about child support, the guidelines. All you guys know about that stuff out there. I know a little bit about it, but I thought I would invite two attorneys to help me and to help you understand. Now, during the program, we'll probably flash that number on the screen. If you see the number flashed on the screen, please feel free to call in and ask these guys questions. If you do not see the number on the screen, that means you are watching a tape. It is not live. To my right, Greg Austin. Greg Austin is an attorney in Oregon, primarily in Portland. If you'd like to get a hold of him sometime, let me give you his number. That's 222 6102. Among the things that he is uh, proficient in is uh, domestic relations law and uh, the child support guidelines. Now to my left is Vic DeFlemick. Now Vic DeFlemick practices law in the state of Washington and he's located in Vancouver and I cannot remember the Vancouver number or the Portland number. He's got two numbers. And uh, Vic, what are those numbers? The Vancouver number is area code 360-750-5572. Portland line is 283588. Uh, is it 283588? Yeah, 286-3588. Eight, eight. Eight, eight, okay. I never call. I can't think of it. Okay, right. Well, I call that <laughs> one. 503 okay. number. So, what we're going to do, guys, we're going to talk about the child support guidelines. Now, we do this from time to time. We talk about custody, visitation, and child support, all right? Now, a while back, I attended some, uh, some meetings or a meeting. It dealt with uh, the state of Oregon and child support, where the agency itself, Support Enforcement, uh, had a discussion about some of the bills coming through and administrative procedures. Now, if we're ready, I'd like the control room to roll the tape on a discussion from Larry Thompson, who is in charge of support enforcement, talking about administrative procedures. Roll tape. view of the administrative decision-making process is, I don't want to use the term rough justice too roughly, but it handles the high volume work, and it's accurate most of the time, works for most of the people, and it's cost-effective, efficient, and those are your priorities. In the extraordinary cases, it probably doesn't work for, and they need to be decided in the court or some other process. If you give preclusive effect to the decisions of these hearings officers, they will feel, and their lawyers will feel obliged to make more of a record uh, and complete matters, uh, more discovery, uh, this kind of thing, at this level, and basically change that process. It's no longer, it's a mixed process. It's no longer the quick, quick one. So it'll be one kind of hearing for people that are represented or sophisticated. It'll be another kind of hearing for those that are not. Uh, the hearing officers themselves will have a different view of their role because sophisticated folks are getting one form of dinner and the other folks are not. They'll want to try and, hey, this should be evenly applied. So in the unrepresented cases, they will start doing more discovery on their own, uh, more of an inquisitorial process, being a duty to make more of a record. And uh, I would rather have it that the judges bifurcated on their end. Some of them are more fond of our process than others and will send the case back and let us do the support type work uh, than to do it this way, where some judges are quite comfortable with it and others are not. My other philosophical point is that the state of Oregon has something that I don't think you'll find in any other state in, the, in what's been delegated to the administrative process. Everything from sophisticated civil penalties to modifying judicial decrees. If the bench and the bar don't buy off on that, we set up a domino effect of losing not just little pieces where they're unhappy, but it sort of starts to roll and you lose it all. Maybe even to issues of separation of powers and the appropriate allocation of functions. In fact, in the many latest administrative law journal out of the American Bar Association, it's a big discussion of Judge Scalia's role of separation of powers. 
we would not be having child support hearing officers under Judge Scalia's view of the world as a constitutional matter. So my inclination is to protect, I hate to say as long as we can, if these things do move in cycles, but to protect the administrative process in its current version. And I think that this approach, well-intentioned and, and uh, it's a philosophical discussion and maybe and I could be just flat wrong on the facts and the practical effect, but half of the judges don't want any administrative hearing officer precluding some decision of theirs. The other half might be quite just comfortable with that. Thank you. Uh, and ominously enough, guess what happened just within the last month? The uh, House of Representatives has abolished the hearings function in the Department of Revenue, transferred in mass all those hearing officers to the tax court, created a new function, judicial function, tax magistrate, and we don't have administrative hearings in our revenue anymore. That goes through. Okay, what that was all about, in case you didn't understand, of course he was talking about administrative law process, where the Office of Support Enforcement sometimes calls you guys in or calls you over the telephone. You have what is called a telephone hearing. Uh, the agency or the agent that represents the agency goes over uh, the guidelines, goes over the rules, looks up your income on a table, the number of children that you have, and then figures your child support based on a set of tables and the rules. Now, Greg Austin is here to help us with that. Again, if you have any questions on that, please feel free to, to call in and to ask questions. Uh, the first thing I'm going to do is just ask something general. Now, you may have some specific questions. Greg, what about these guidelines? First off, you've heard about them, no doubt. You've seen them. You've read them. you read the rules. Do you, are they fair? Are they necessary? Just a general statement about the guidelines. Well, I think you have to uh, really see them in their historical context uh, to get a, a to get a, a, an honest answer to that. The guidelines exist because the federal government five years ago said that any state that did not implement guidelines would lose their federal welfare money, their aid for dependent children. So all of these guidelines in all of the states were implemented at, as a federal mandate and the the people behind that were the people who were distributing uh, aid for dependent children, welfare money. Sure. So these guidelines really are intended to enable the state to uh, recapture welfare money. Okay. And in the context of welfare recipients and their children and their absentee spouses, they may make a lot of sense. From my perspective, they make a lot less sense when the idea of, of capturing that uh, tax collection process, if you will, and applying it to uh, people who aren't in a tax collection mode, gotcha. I think begins to break down. So, well, What then, about, okay, you, I think you, you, uh, you spelled it out very uh, specifically, precisely, and concisely for welfare repayment to the state. So that brings up the other side of the coin. What about, Greg, non-welfare cases? Why would there be guidelines then for those who are, have spouses that are not on welfare? Well, Why would they apply? I think there are two reasons. Uh, the first is that in order to legitimize guidelines for welfare parents, then the guidelines have to apply. To all. across the board. Okay. Uh, and uh, a second reason, and probably a, a better one, is that uh, there, there's, there's an, a goal of judicial economy, if you will. I mean, the courts are bogged down. Everybody knows the courts are bogged down, and they, in fact, are bogged down. So if we can reduce some of the things that people argue about in court to a, uh, to a formula, to a grid, to, to walking across and throwing a dart at a box on a piece of paper, then to that extent there's a lot less uh, uh, work okay. thrown into courts. 
Do you have, uh, now I'm gonna, I'm gonna turn my attention to the Washington side of the river here and Vic de Fleming. And I wonder, Vic, do you have any different take on the... Well, I just, I think I'd add, add a little bit to that in that um, I think that what, it, what uh, the purpose of the child support guidelines, one of the, adding to what Greg has said, it brings some uniformity to that process, and it's not just judicial, judicial economy, but I think it's the economy uh, as it affects the people involved, too, because it does take, it takes a lot of the emotion out of the child support setting process. It makes it more of a numbers game. Um, and, you know, as everybody knows, going through court is a long, tedious, expensive, traumatic process, and anything that you can take away from that to make it, to reduce it to a numbers game, makes the divorce or child support process um, a lot simpler, a little less dramatic for people. All right, let me play the devil's advocate for either one who wants to take this on. Suppose I say, and, and I want you to listen to this too, uh, those of you watching, why should there be guidelines which are structured as we have seen? And uh, maybe we can get a camera in on this. I don't know whether we can get a camera to pick this up or not. Can we get one of the cameras, maybe uh, number two, to pick this up? Uh, why do we need a, a set of guidelines which are, um, should we go which way? Right there, okay. Come right on in on it, number two. Why do we need a set of guidelines which are so complicated? Across the top, we can see family sizes across the top. We can see income size, uh, incomes down the side. Why does it have to be that complicated? Why can it not be simple? And let me offer a suggestion. The state pays out so much money in foster care. Real simple number, a foster care dollar. And so just on the principle here, guys, and I know that you're not, neither one of these guys are legislators. They don't know why the legislature does what it does. And it's not, uh, it's, this, this is not their doing. But I thought I would ask, why wouldn't it be simple enough just to say, well, if the state pays out X number of dollars for foster care, why not make that the guideline level? And anyone who, who um, <coughs> wants to pay more, hey, have at it. Any, any comments, guys? I think, I think you need to keep in mind that when the state is paying out welfare, uh, 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 foster care dollars, they're paying out the state's dollars. And that's not the same thing as when the state is mandating the dollars that you and I should pay. Okay, you got anything, Vic? Um, well, I, I don't think I really have anything to add to that, I guess. Okay. Uh, we're going to get into the guidelines themselves now. We're going to talk about numbers and figures. We're going to talk about uh, some of the rules. And as, as we have compared notes, and perhaps you know, uh, guys in Oregon may make out a little better on the numbers than guys in Washington, and maybe there's a reason for that. We've got a little more footage to run, and what I'd like to do is um, run a little footage that has to do with um, fathers, young fathers, those who may be teenage or in their early 20s, and how the system sets up in the first place. It's designed to capture these young guys and uh, put them into the system right off the bat. And during the discussion, I raised the question, and perhaps we can see that in this particular footage. Roll tape, please. Well, you're right, Richard, but uh, the issue, this particular issue, has to do with minor children as well. I, I've Richard. tried to stay out of the conversation to let these bills get, uh, get talked about, but this is just biting uh, to, uh, uh, to get discussed here on that 310 issue in the subject matter. I wonder why the philosophy then cannot be expanded with this type of philosophy. Why not then consider the minor child boy, male, also for custody? I mean, it, it seems as though you've gone around and you've checked with her grandparents, you checked with the grandparents on the other side, and no one has asked. Suppose this kid's well, working at uh, yeah. some uh, some Burger King someplace, flipping hamburgers, making five bucks an hour. Then why not have the same logic and say, young man, do you want to care for this child? Would you like that, custody that bill does of the not child? Address that, and the bill doesn't preclude that. The, uh, the the fact of the matter is, if paternity is established, uh, that young man, at least legally, 
has all the rights that the young woman has to uh, to ask for and to obtain custody. You know? Legally, yes, but you and I both know the deck is stacked, and we've even talked around it. And I've I've tried. I wanted to stay out of it, but at this point, I'm saying, look, you're, you're going Let's all the way around, but you never ask the guy for custody. The bill is dead in the water. Yeah. No, the fact is, so I mean, it's just in the program, the program hasn't changed in 20 years, and the fact is, the feds won't pass to deal with custody Understood. issues. Understood. And we just don't get there. Okay, let's go on. Let's go. Okay. Um, okay. Three, 392, Senate Bill 392 has passed. Uh, the Senate... It's been voted on. Uh, no, the Senate uh, Judiciary Committee uh, will be on the third reading calendar any day now, meaning it will be voted on at the, on the floor of the Senate. Uh, this is the Occupational Licensing Bill. Uh, we borrowed from our friends in Washington a list of, of uh, I'm sorry, I'm getting that confused with the, one of the other subjects, which I'll get around to in a minute. Uh, we have, we have regulated for the last two years under 1993 Senate Bill 975, we have regulated uh, seven industries, or seven occupations, uh, and uh, suspended licenses uh, in seven occupational areas for failure to make an agreement to pay child support. This bill, 392, expands that concept to all occupations and professions which require a permit, certificate, registration, or license from the state of Oregon. In addition, it covers an area which is similar to uh, an occupational license, but not quite. It also requires, for the same reasons, the suspension of any license issued by the OLCC. So if you own a, an establishment which, which sells alcoholic beverages, you have to have a license to, to run that establishment. That is not an occupational license per se. But that license also is subject to suspension under this law. So it's any occupational license issued by the state of Oregon plus licenses issued by the Oregon Liquor Control Commission. Any license by the OLCC? Any license issued by OLCC. So that would be a bartender's license, which is a, uh, that's pretty close to an occupational license. But in addition, the owner of the establishment, Richard, would have to have a license to run that establishment, and that license would also be subject to suspension. All right, the reason for running that is to let you know that there are plenty of pitfalls in the child support uh, issue, some of it in the guidelines, some of it in the, the way it is played out. And maybe uh, through uh, Greg Austin here, we might learn a little bit about some of the pitfalls. First off, the guidelines are set up as a general guide and a general standard. Uh, there are some rebuttable presumptions that one can address when they're first set up, uh, when you are first confronted with them. I have a list of some of the rebuttable presumptions, but um, Maybe uh, Greg Austin might know of some ideas that he would like to tell a guy if he's going through a uh, if he's going through a hearing. What are some of the things that he wants to consider? What are some of the do's and don'ts if he's going through a child support hearing? Let's make an assumption that he's either already required to pay, or he's in the system about to get nailed. What are some of the do's and don'ts in that first uh, encounter? or in that encounter, even if it's a modification? Well, most people coming into the system, uh, the child support collection system, in my experience, come in through one of two doors. They either come in through the uh, divorce courts or they come in from uh, contact with SED, uh, affiliation, if you will, if somebody's been named the parent or father of a child. and in that those administrative hearings that they were talking about on the first tape that we watched is really those the primary function of those administrative hearings is to levy child support uh, taxes if you will on uh, parents who are getting hammered for the first time uh, that's where they come from when 
When people come in through the divorce courts, they are maybe signing up for child support the very first, for the first time, but it's an entirely different context, and they're not, they're not, their admission to, uh, <laughs> to, to the game does not begin with a letter from uh, the state. These guys that come in through the administrative hearings, first notice of anything that's going on is very often a, a letter, for, uh, kind of like that Uncle Sam wants you letter, except it says, uh, we want your money. And the letter is, in my opinion, somewhat deceptive, because what it says is that it, to a lot of people is, uh, listen, uh, we're going to assess child support against you and unless you contest it. And if you want to contest the assessment of child support, then, then you must do something about that. You have to request a hearing within 30 days. Okay. All right. Uh, Greg has given us a little bit of insight. Now, I've got to look to my crew here. Do we have a call on the line that we need to take? Okay. We'll, we'll take the call out. And again, we're talking about child support. We're going to try to get into it as deeply as we possibly can here. Uh, so if uh, the call will, will come through, we'll, we'll deal with the call and handle the call. Uh, hello there, caller. Hello. You have a question for Greg Austin or for Victor Fleming? Well, not, not really. I just uh, wanted to make a stand on this uh, issue, and that is uh, uh, I, I, I just don't believe in it. You, you don't know, believe in the, the in child, child support? support period. Okay. Uh, There's a lot of guys out there that's like that. Yeah, well. Uh, and you're one of them. Yeah, yeah, I'm one do of you, them at uh, about $48,000 worth. Yeah, I'm one of them. Uh, do you uh, owe child support now? $48,000. Uh, are you refusing to pay? Yes, I am. Have you made your, uh, well, I guess the fact that you have an arrearage uh, is, is obvious. Are you, uh, are you being sought out? Are you, is there an arrest warrant out for you? Mm, not that I know of. And uh, if they are, uh, <laughs> have fun trying to find me. Is, uh, as simple as that. I've been a mole for about uh, 15 years on this situation. And uh, it's got down to the point to where I'm going to go out and get me a shirt and I'm going to put on there, I'm proud to be a deadbeat dad. Okay. <laughs> anything, uh, anything, anything else you want to say there? Uh, the point is, is I, I don't feel that the government should be dealing in other people in, 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 in a common person's life. I mean, I send my kids uh, uh, money, uh, and, and I have my kids uh, uh, six months out of the year. And uh, whenever uh, uh, this woman uh, uh, decides she don't want to uh, work anymore, she goes off and sets on welfare. Have, and uh, I, I think welfare should just totally be abolished. Okay. Uh, have you made your, uh, your political uh, thoughts known to the governor? Is it an Oregon issue? Uh, no, it's a uh, Colorado issue. Have you uh, um, written to uh, the legislators in Colorado and let them know? Uh, well, let me, let me in-depth this a little bit more, the reason why it stands as it is. Uh, I was in uh, Colorado at this, when this happened, right? And... Uh, uh, what has caused this situation to go as it is, is uh, those people, I had a $5 an hour job down there. These people come in, they wanted 65% uh, of my wages, and uh, that was after uh, the state took their taxes, the federal taxes, so on and so forth. So that give me about, uh, uh, what, 58 bucks every two weeks uh, to live on. Okay, well, this is with November. Those people tried to kill me down there. Have you ever tried to sleep in a pino in November in Colorado? Got, uh, your point is very well taken. <laughs> Let me thank you very much for the call, and, and maybe we can uh, deal with, uh, with your Well, I, I appreciate this, too, because I've been wanting to make this known for ever since I've seen your program a long time ago, and uh, this is the first time I've been able to call you. Well, but I just want to say, down with welfare. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you for your political point of view. Uh, there are a lot of guys out there. Do you get very many of those in your office who think, who will say exactly what he has said, that he doesn't think that they should pay and he refuses to pay and he will run up a forty or $50,000 debt? Uh, I get a lot of people who have large uh, amounts of child support past due, but I get very few people who, who take the position that they do not have an obligation of some sort. Okay. Uh, 
and I think some of them have just kind of surrendered. They're beaten down, and then they, they're not going to argue with the state's proposition that they have to pay. But I think the vast majority of the people that I encounter express to me that they feel obliged to contribute to the cost of raising their children. Let's, uh, let's ask Vic to Fleming. Vic, what's your experience? Now, you My deal experience with... My experience is pretty much similar to that. It, it, the only thing, the only difference, I mean, well, it's not even a difference. I'm sure Greg gets this, too. The only thing I would add to that is I have people, most of my clients, the, the dads or the obligor, whoever it is, um, to acknowledge that they have a, an obligation from the, to pay for the child's welfare or the children's welfare. The only thing I might add to that is there's a lot, a lot of feeling that it's unfair the level that it's set at, and that's just you know, depending on where the guidelines fall for that particular person, they think this is just burdensome. In some cases, it's out of ignorance because they come in and they find out that it can be modified for whatever reason, down to what is more appropriate for their level. Okay. Oftentimes, what happens is they get caught up in the system. Somebody gets a divorce or a paternity action and the state or somebody sets the uh, child support level at some high level, high figure, and they don't feel that they can fight that. They just accept it somehow and try and scrabble by. Um, that, that leads right into what I uh, need to ask you, too, just as I asked uh, Greg when we opened up on this uh, discussion. What are some of the things that a guy in Washington with a Washington order should consider when they go into a hearing, whether it's a a modification type hearing or a review process hearing or whether it's for the first time. What does he need to know when he goes in there? It's been my experience, for instance, that the agency, uh, whether it's now in Oregon, we have, uh, as you guys know, we have, you could go in two different doors. You could go in the district attorney's door for non-welfare cases or you could go into the uh, attorney general's office support enforcement division for welfare type cases. Uh, I think in Washington, you don't have it split that way. You go in one place, whether it's welfare or non-welfare. Is that correct? Pretty much. Okay. Um, I mean, the, the child support, support enforcement may, may come after you for a paternity action, but much of it goes to the courts. That's true. What does a guy need to know uh, when they go in? Now, my experience has been that the agency will always highball the guy. That is, and yeah. by highballing, I yeah. mean, they uh, suppose you make 20000 a year or twenty five. Uh, the agency will send you a notice that they think you make uh, thirty or thirty-five thousand a year, and then make you, the guy, prove that you make less. And then, so that way, you're ready to bring out your bank account slips and your payroll slips and so on. And if you don't, the error is on the high side. Is that your experience? That's, that's true. And I might, I guess, I, I might put this. I have a, a heavy tax practice as well, and I might kind of correlate this to income tax. Um, when the IRS, for instance, kind of does a return for you basically. They do a return without any exemptions, any deductions. They just say this is your income and tax you want. It's the same way with the child support enforcement people in Washington. They'll come in and say, okay, we think that you make this much money and bang, here's your highball as you put it. Uh, and it's your burden. They get served with a 20 day notice to come in and prove that's different. A lot of times the dads get this thing, there's a huge sheaf of papers. And I've had cases where they're, they come in, they're overwhelmed by that, they don't know what to do, so they don't do anything, 20 days pass, and lo and behold, they're stuck. Let's try to do a little comparison, <laughs> and I don't know whether this will be uh, good or not uh, because of the way these things are figured. If we were to look on the tables, whether the tables were uh, guidelines out of Oregon or the guidelines out of Washington, if a guy had $2,000 uh, worth of uh, income, gross income a month, he makes two grand a month. Let's say he also has two kids. Now here's where the problem is. The problem is in computing it, guys. We all know that. But if we used a raw figure, how, how do we, can we make a comparison, Greg, in the first place? Is in Washington and Oregon? Yeah. Well, we can if we want to. Washington is based on, uh, on, on net after-tax income. Their guideline runs off of after-tax income and Oregon's guideline runs off of gross before-tax income. So we're going to have to make some kind of an adjustment, maybe knock uh, uh, Oregon down by a third or something like that. We, can, we could say, for example, that a father who makes $2,000 gross in Oregon maybe makes About takes 16 home 1500 1500 <laughs> $1,500 in, uh, 
in Washington. And the other thing we have to fold into this is uh, the custodial parents' income. Oh, yeah. Because they get added together for purposes of this computation. And, and interestingly enough, one of the things that means in my experience is that the more money the custodial parent makes, the, the more money the non-custodial parent, parent has pays. to pay. It's the mathematics <laughs> of it. What, what about your end now? Um, I don't think that's, that qu is, aspect is quite true, but there's some other aspects that go into this too. I don't know about Washington, or Oregon rather, but, but Washington has a provision in there where if you have a custodial parent who is not working, voluntarily not working, you can impute income to her. Oh, yeah. A, the, some levels for that. I don't know if Oregon has something similar to that. Yeah, we yeah. do, but only to uh, minimum wage. Okay. Okay. I understand we have a call or two that's been waiting on the line oh. while we talk about these things, and we're ready to take a couple more calls. We've got more tapes. We'll try to get through some of these guidelines is issues. And let me apologize for not being any more specific, but this is kind of a general subject. Each uh, particular case is unique to itself. So let's take a call here. And hello, caller. Welcome to the Dad's Television Network. Uh, good evening. Good evening. Uh, yeah, I have a 17, or she's almost 17-year-old daughter. Uh, since the age of 15 and a half, other than almost uh, a year and a half now, she has not been attending any school at all. Uh, she's dropped out. My understanding is child support is for the health, education, and welfare of the child. Uh, and I was wondering, is it potentially possible to get some child support relief because she's not been in school, even though she's not a, even though she is still a minor? Uh, this uh, this is an Oregon issue, is that right? Correct. Okay. Uh, let me ask you to take your answer over the air, if you don't mind, unless sure, you have another no one. Sure. No problem. Thank oh, you. Okay. No. 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 Uh, the, the statute in Oregon is very simple and straightforward. Child support is payable until the child is 18 or 21, 21 if, if a child attending school. school. Or as 107.108A. Yeah. Now, here's, here's what I think he's getting at. I'm going to throw you a curve. Uh -huh. If the child is not attending school and working, uh, what's the possibility of running through an emancipation process and saying the child is now emancipated and so therefore uh, I'm out of here? On, with my wallet. Well, it's the, the statutes define certain kinds of things that minor children can do that take them out of the, the recipient's bucket. But, yeah. They can get married. A father, a non-custodial parent... Wait, wait just a second, Greg. <laughs> I, that's interesting. Now, now, it doesn't go to this caller here, but I had a guy call me. He says he's got a 16-year-old uh, with the woman who's on welfare and the 16 year old is now pregnant unmarried and she's going on welfare too and he says now wait a minute do I still have to pay child support for my 16 year old daughter who's pregnant by another man and the state's taking care of, her, uh, of his 16 year old daughter on welfare and he says well how, this doesn't make sense well not only is he going to have to continue paying child support for the pregnant daughter and subsequent mother daughter but it is a good chance that his child support obligation is going to go up because of the special needs associated oh, with my goodness. the cost of child care, the additional cost of raising this infant, if there's any difficulty in the delivery. I don't want to hear any more. Is it the same in, or in Washington? Well, it's pretty much that way. Um, <laughs> there's, there's not much you can do in that situation, unfortunately. So if, if a guy's paying uh, child support, to a woman on welfare who happens to have a daughter, and the daughter is a teenager and becomes pregnant, yeah, I don't he still know has would, to pay. I, I don't know that that it would continue on to the teen, or there would be an a, an extra for the teenager um, in that situation, but it would continue for the daughter. Okay, I'm, yeah. I want to get uh, Greg back in the picture here. Now, <laughs> the special circumstances for which uh, this caller was talking about, if the daughter, in this case, is away from home, earning money then he would have to go to the state, go to court on a show cause? Well, he didn't say that she was away from home and earning money. What he, this caller spelled out, as I recall, was that the daughter simply had dropped out of school. Okay. Uh, and in those circumstances, it doesn't make any difference. Okay. He still has to pay support. If the child left home, established her own place to live, had a uh, and income sufficient to support herself and the child went to court on her own hook and 
because she's the only one who has standing to do this, and sought a court order that she was emancipated, then his obligation to pay child support would end. I hope that answered that question. I think, uh, Paul, if you're out there, call in with the rest of the question. I think we've got a caller or two on the line, and let's take another call or two. Uh, hello, caller. Welcome to the Dad's Television Network. Hi. Uh, I've, I've got a question. Uh, my ex was a, is a legal secretary, and she really knew how to manipulate the <laughs> system. <laughs> okay. Never marry one. Um, <laughs> I've... I just, I've been watching you for a couple of weeks, and I, I just sent off and got a copy of these guidelines myself, and then I switched you on, and here you were talking about it. And I, I'm looking at this, and I've discovered I'm paying about three times too much, uh, you know, just from off the raw table. Well, just, just out of curiosity, how much are you paying for how many children? I've just got one kid, but I don't want to tell, you know, get... You don't want to say how much you're paying? No, I, I, I prefer not to. But okay. Can I Can't recover any you. of that? I'm sorry. Can, Can you I recover any of what I what I feel like I've I've been overpaid? Uh, now I'm not an attorney, and, and and thanks for asking that question because I love answering or attempting to answer some of these questions. And this brings out a point. Uh, whether you know it or not, I'm probably being watched very closely by the Oregon State Bar. You, many people know that we've been sued by the bar, the, and some of these issues that we talk about are administrative in nature, and some of them are uh, more legal in nature. And it, it becomes a very much of a gray area on some of these administrative uh, procedures. But I think that with the aid of an attorney here, maybe I'm protected by saying so, I'll defer to the attorney. I think that uh, you cannot recover anything that has been paid out uh, unless you go to court with an order and uh, require that the amount be reduced and they'll probably reduce you uh, your amount as of the time that you make the request, but anything that's gone over the dam, so to speak, is gone. Now, uh, Mr. Austin, you're on. Correct me. Uh, generally speaking, what you said is true. There is an exception to that after the child is 18. If the non-custodial parent is continuing to pay money for a child who's over 18, and the child, it turns out, is not a child attending school, then the non-custodial parent has, can go back to mom and say, give me my money back because you had a statutory obligation to notify me. Oh, yeah. Okay. All right. Uh, and if, if, if I'm not mistaking, that's uh, ORS 107.415. Uh, I don't think. know. It's in there somewhere. <laughs> okay. Uh, any response on the, that's, uh, on the Washington that's side? That's basically the law in Washington as well. You okay. can't get it back. Okay. Um, do we have another caller out there? If we do, let's take a call. If not, we'll roll on. Uh, we've got another piece of footage. Uh, I didn't sense that there was a call out there. We've got another piece of footage that I'd like to share with you just to bring the support enforcement agency into it. Uh, let's see, what is this particular piece of footage? Oh, they're talking about a, uh, the Lord Mansfield Law. Uh, the Lord Mansfield Law actually says, well, let's roll the tape and you'll see it. Uh, roll tape, please. The old Lord Mansfield Law, the old common law, which is codified in Oregon and in most states, is that a child born to a married couple, husband not sterile, not impotent, is the legal child of the husband conclusively, period, no questions asked. That was probably good law, it may still be good law, that was probably good when I say good, I, it, is, it is good law in Oregon today. When I say good, I'm meritorious. It may be a good idea to preserve that statute, that, that idea. It certainly was a good idea in the old days when, when, when it was very difficult or impossible to tell who the biological father was for purposes of supporting children. Uh, it was probably a very good idea. The truth is today, uh, more and more uh, husbands are saying, I'm, I don't care what the loss is, I'm not the father of that child. And of course, blood tests, the DNA tests can, can determine that. Okay, again, uh, the Lord Mansfield Law assumes that you guys who are married to the women uh, are the fathers of the children that the woman that you're married to. But we know that this is 1995 and that uh, not all women are fully faithful, just like not all men are fully faithful. Uh, I might ask you guys, 
if you were uh, in the legislature, these guys are not legislators, would you consider revising the, the presumed fatherhood of these guys who are married to the woman and say, okay, let's, uh, in 1995, let's make it a, uh, an issue that before a guy is ordered to pay child support for about 20, 21 years, that he has an opportunity to verify paternity. Do you think that would make good law, Greg? Well, it's, it, it, part of the problem we're having right here is that, that the law has been misstated on the tape. Okay. Uh, what they said there was that you're, this is a conclusive presumption that if the father is, if the parents are married, then the child is the dad's. And number one, the parents have to be married and cohabitating at the time of conception or birth for a presumption All right. to arise. Okay. okay. A disputable presumption. So at, are you suggesting then that if a guy is going through divorce and let's say he's a dark haired fellow like myself and his wife has a couple of blondes or red headed kids uh, that I would say that I probably could not produce, I'd say, well, uh, you, you know, I got a question about this. Would you? Would you, if you were representing me, help me then as the presumed father get out of the child support and, and uh, maybe someone else's nickel? Yeah, but I don't think I could do it on the strength of the appearance of the child relative to the appearance of the children. What, well, that would be my first thought. I'd, I'd say, uh, well, that, that's not mine. Well, that's not going to convince the average reluctant judge. Well, then what do I need? You need what's called an HLA test something to do with the blood? You need about $800 worth of DNA testing. Okay. And, and you need to force mom to bring the child for and herself. You need three sets of blood, mom's, mm -hmm. child's, and dad's. I need a court order for that because yep. she probably wouldn't do that yep. willingly. Right. Will the judge order it on my suspicion? Uh, judge is not going to want to because of this presumption and because they don't want to clutter the water. Okay. Uh, anything in Washington? What are my options in Washington if I think that, if I have a suspicion that I'm not the father, the biological mm -hmm. father of the child that my wife brings into the world, what can I do? Well, I, I had a case just recently where um, my client, the dad, was the presumed father. He was not the biological father, and mother acknowledged that. Uh, the uh, state of Washington went in and assessed him anyway as a presumed father. He came, he's coming to me and going, well, now, we know there's the actual father out there. Why aren't they going after him? I said, well, you're here. The Lord you're Mansfield e rule. Yeah, you're here and you're easy to get. They yeah. don't want to go chase him. So we had to go through an administrative process to, uh, to get him out of that situation. But so he, get, he went through the divorce. <coughs> he mm -hmm. was getting a divorce. Yeah. There was a child that wasn't we had, his. We had the court proceeding, and then we had the administrative proceeding over here saying, you're paying child support on this, this child. And we had the court, our divorce action, stating that we didn't even have a child in here. Okay, so is he paying child support for that child? He today? is not now. He okay. is not. At, at, we got him out of that. We got him divorced and got him out of that. Situation. Okay, then, then the the former question comes up that a guy okay. asks: Can he recover anything that he put no, out? No, he's out. He's just that's just gone. Okay. Now I understand we have a caller on the <coughs> line or two, so let's take the caller and thank you very much for waiting. Welcome to the Dad's Television Network. Hello, caller. Hello. Yeah, what's your question? Well, I had a circumstance. I live in Washington County, and um, I got divorced and, and have been paying child support for quite a few years. And all of a sudden, my wife wants to have, the, have me pay the state. I was paying her directly. So I started doing that. My son decided that he would come and live with uh, my wife and I, my new wife and I. So he came and lived for two months, and then the third month he went back home. Well, uh, she took me to court uh, and wanted child support from me uh, while he was living here. So we went to court. In, <laughs> we went to court. In you need not go any further. Is that your question? Do you have to pay? Uh, no, no. I, I, what I wanted to say is that there's a little uh, more part on that. So uh, I, I got a judgment against her. I, I won in court. Uh, they sent the district attorney sent me a copy of the law, and I won. But what happened is, is that they were. You're lucky, to, I think. But go ahead. Well, they sent me a copy, <laughs> or didn't send me a copy of this letter. We filed our income tax, our state income tax, and they took five hundred dollars out of my account uh, and, and said that I was uh, uh, owing that for child support. After about oh yeah, after about yeah. four hours of, of calling, 
uh, we finally got a hold of somebody down at the state, and they're going to send us a check in the next three or four days. They said they made a mistake. Good for you. You know, you've been awfully lucky, Guy. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm glad to hear that story. I don't hear those kind very much. There's another element that plays into this, too. Do you get the exemption? No. Okay, maybe next year you'll get the exemption. Well, I don't know. I, you know, I, uh, is he with you or with her now? He's with back with her again. Okay, you don't get the exemption. But uh, I was really surprised that the district attorney sent us a copy of the law before we went to, to, to court. And, I mean, it was pretty cut and dried. I don't think the, the, the judge could have uh, found any other way. Just consider yourself lucky. <laughs> I Th do. Thank you very much for the call. Okay, that wonderful thanks. story. Bye. Uh, Greg, you would call him lucky too, right? <laughs> Would you call him lucky? I'd say I, I second that. <laughs> okay. Do we have another call on the line? Let me look to the crew see if we have another call on the line. Do we? Do we? Do we? Yes. Hello. Hello. How are you doing this evening? Hey, I appreciate the information on the show. Sure. I have a, a two-part question. I'll take the answer off the air. Thank you. Um, I recently received a letter from the state uh, that they had intercepted uh, tax refunds and my payments for child support were due at the first of the month and the garnish on or basically the interception of the the uh, tax refunds were done at the same time. My account is uh, current. Uh, however, trying to contact the state, the information that they have is that it will take 120 days uh, for them to finish processing and return my refund that I'm due, even you know having yeah. a, a, uh, an account that's clear. Is there anything that can be done to uh, speed up the process, or, or I guess my better question is why does it take 120 days? Gotcha. Now, what's your second part? And I'm going to ask you to turn your television down. The, uh, the, the sounds kind of vibrate through the phones and the equipment here. That's what we heard. What's your second uh, part? Well, the two questions are, one, um, what can I do? To speed up the speed process? Up the process, but the important thing that really boggles my mind is why it takes 120 days for the state to clear the refund back out when they know that the balance is, is current. And we're talking about a federal refund? Federal and state both. Okay, thank you very much for the question. Which one of you guys want to tackle that? I am absolutely unwilling to speculate on uh, anything about why it takes the government so long to do anything. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's probably it, why. It takes them a long time to do everything except Take your collect money. taxes. Yeah, okay. Vic, you want to? Uh, all I'd add to that, I do a lot of tax work, like I said before. And dealing with the Department of Revenue, Oregon Department of Revenue, or IRS, everything takes a long time because you're talking about large bureaucracies. IRS is bigger than Oregon, but they're both bureaucracies. People go, things go through a lot of people's hands. It takes a long time. That's just the way it is. And I'm going to, I'm going to uh, stick my foot in the water here and maybe in my mouth, but uh, the uh, systems are different, and and I, and I don't want to appear as though I'm taking the side of the state or trying to soft pedal what the state does but because your name is on that list the IRS list you will be hit they have uh, the IRS itself the intercept section has no control over that that's a state issue and sometimes guys are found to be current but their name or their social security number is still on that intercept list and they operate independently. And I have run across many cases where guys are current, and sometimes, very few times, but sometimes they're ahead, and their name is still on that interstate, uh, on that uh, IRS hit list. Again, because they're independent, and whatever the agency is in the state that has to do that has to either send the letter or make the phone call to pull the dogs off of you. And if they don't do it, they're still on you. And just because you've been hit with an intercept has nothing to do with whether you are current or behind or anything else. It means your name is on the hit list and someone forgot to remove it. That's about as simple as I can make it. Anything you want to add? Yeah, just I think we need to uh, give the devil her due uh, where, <laughs> Oregon, <laughs> where Oregon is concerned. Uh, the fact that people can call up, point out a mistake, and get an apology and admission, we made a mistake, we'll send you your money back. Uh, we need to rejoice about that. Okay. I have represented clients in Alaska, Montana, Idaho, and Nebraska who were, who, who were Oregon residents and had child support, uh, 
judgments in those outside states. And those states, these four, these four men were current in their taxes, in their child support. But through various messes and misunderstandings and, and welfare frauds on the part of the moms, the state where mom was wanted a piece of dad. Mm -hmm. So they turned him in and they garnished or grabbed his tax returns and in each of those circumstances I spent a lot of my clients money each time and each time I was unable to recover anything. Okay. Their response was, well if you think we made a mistake uh, you'll have to sue us. <laughs> and t when somebody lives in Oregon and, and the idea of going and, and hiring a $400 an hour lawyer in Alaska to f that you, that, where you've never been to file a lawsuit and fight against the state trying to get back a couple of thousand dollars, it's absurd. Okay, we've got another caller out there patiently waiting. So hello caller, and this may be our last call, but uh, go ahead with your question or comment. I have a question. Um, the state of Oregon is currently garnishing 60% of my wages for four children that I've had by prior marriage. I would like to know what the difference is between Oregon and Washington as to how much they can legally take from a guy till you fall underneath the guidelines of poverty. <laughs> Do you have a limit on that? That's I, always a question. They, and I mean, let there's me, no life after what they've got going Well, here. actually what he's playing to in Oregon, they send out a little statement that they can, the state can take up to 50 plus percent, it's 52 or 53, and then they refer to some federal law, which is uh, codified in uh, U.S. Code 15 section something or other, which has to do with uh, some sort of limits on, uh, on garnishment and uh, consumer debt and a whole bunch of things like that. That's basically the case in Washington, too. It's not, it's not that much different in Washington. It's, it's in regards to so he wants to know uh, how much they what's the, what's the upper limit I guess on those percentages which uh, is over well, 50 percent. Yeah, Oregon isn't. Gonna, I mean, Washington isn't going to be any different than, than Oregon in his case. Um, I mean, he's going to if he's thinking of moving to Washington, they get a lower. <laughs> lower it won't happen. Yeah, it's not going to happen. I mean, it's, it's going to be any, the same. Anything uh, from you on that? I was under the impression that they couldn't take couldn't garnish more than 25 percent of net. Okay. But that varies. Uh, caller, are, is this all one divorce or two, set, two or more families? No, this is one divorce. And what they've done is they've, they've attached 60% of my wages. I now have custody of one, one child, but I'm still paying child support on the other three. And I've tried to get the uh, Department of uh, Support Enforcement to lower my child support, which I'm, I've been through a five-month process trying to get this done so far, and no, nothing's happened. Yeah, why uh, that, don't you hire a lawyer? Well, every lawyer that I've tried to hire tells me it's an insurmountable progress or, or process and that, you know, they're unwilling to take it because it, the state of Oregon is such a mess, they don't know what to do with it concerning, you know, child when's, support. When's the, last time you, when's the last time your child support amount was... Uh, Modified? Was, ...was reviewed? Uh, they just went through review here less than two months ago. I pay 750 a month. Is what's coming out of my page. For, uh, is that a current amount, or does that include a rearage to boot? Uh, I think that is is current plus an arrearage. What's the split on your current and arrearage, please? Um, current is like uh, 100, 100, 98, 98, and the arrearage, I don't know what that is. I can't get them to send me any records as to what they're doing with my money or where they're putting it. Well, look, we're probably not going to solve your problem over the air, but I'm going to thank you for the call. And then in addition, I'm going to say, if you want to talk with Greg Austin sometime, his number is 222-6102. And you guys can get together and talk about it. There's no way that we're going to resolve that. We're, we're closely running out of time. I want to show a piece of footage if uh, the control room is ready. Uh, we've got a one minute piece or so that we might be able to get on and, and run through. It's a positive thing about fathers. Roll tape there, control room. Can we? 2007, and I don't know what, you know, every one house, of these, house, excuse house, me, house, house, house Bill 2007, I don't know, there's a story behind every bill, and I don't know what the story is behind this one, but it says that paternity shall be established for every case that CSD removes from a home for reasons of abuse. 
Now, um, I, I, I have no idea what the facts were behind this case, but the bill says that CSD shall establish, cause the paternity to be established, or at least attempt to establish paternity for every child born out of wedlock who is removed from an abusive home. I can't imagine why someone would want to legislate that issue. I do, <laughs> Mr. Austin does, and I'm sure Mr. DeFleming does. That's what we're dealing with in Salem. All too often, uh, in a paternity type situation where the father is unknown, then uh, the CSD comes in and removes the, a kid from the home. Fathers are out there looking for their kids. Why not find out who the father is? It, it doesn't make sense not to find out who the father is. The father may be a possible uh, choice for placement of the child. And so there's no law on the books that says CSD has to identify a father. Just take the kid out of the home, put the kid in foster care. I don't think you're being far too optimistic. <laughs> well, the, and so what we're saying is we understand that kind of law, but just think, some of us at, at DADS, we go down there and deal with these agencies, they don't understand what we're talking about at all. You people have to get involved in the legislative process. Please get involved. Now, hopefully we can uh, put another piece of footage in. I don't know if we're ready. If we are, I'll roll that other piece of footage. Uh, can we roll that? Can we? Can't roll it? Can't roll it. Okay. Did we have a call on the line? Let's clear up the switchboard. No call on the line. All right. We'll do some closing remarks. Victor Fleming runs uh, a uh, op operation, runs his law practice in Vancouver, Washington. I don't know the numbers. I'm going to let you give out your Vancouver number. Uh, Vic, what okay. is Vancouver number is 360, it's the area code, 750-5572. The Portland line is 503-286-3588. Now, where are you located? You're on Main in, Street at 111 Main Street? 1111 Main Street. 1111 Main Street. 11th and Main. 11th and Main. And, uh, Downtown what, Vancouver. What floor? 7th floor. 7th floor. See there, you learned something already. <coughs> and also, Greg Austin, gracious enough to come here too on this wonderful day. All of us want to be out doing something else. Uh, where are you located and what's your phone number? 522 Southwest 5th Avenue, Suite 905, Portland. Phone number is 222-6102. Now, you guys that are out there listening, uh, these attorneys were gracious enough to spend their time with us. The, this happens to be a Saturday. You may see it on another day. Um, if you have questions on domestic relations law, uh, maybe you can get some answers from these guys. They're, they don't have free services, but they do know the business that they're dealing with. If you have any closing remarks, Vic, what do you want to uh, share with the guys out there? Uh, I can't think of anything real quick to summarize. <laughs> uh, you know, we've covered a lot of things here. Okay, and Greg?